Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Blue Thunder Pod, AEW edition. I'm your host, Billy Sullivan, flying solo this week. As a result of illness and scheduling issues, uh, I'll be in singles action for uh, both AEW and WWE regular Blue Thunder Pods this week. Sorry, Mom. But back to our our tag team action again next week, and also for... uh, the pay-per-view specials for Double or Nothing and for the Saudi Blood Money uh, King and Queen of the Ring shows. Dave and I are going to record those on Monday. We figured we'd get both perspectives for those. But just for for this week, it's going to be me in singles action. Break it down these shows for you. Dave gave me his, uh, frankly, incredible notes for the WWE shows, but uh, for AEW, it's it's all moi. So (laughs) if the, uh, if the, play-by-play action portion of the show is not quite up to our normal standard. Uh, I do apologize. <laughs> I can't, I am not as good at the play-by-play stuff and the word-for-word promo stuff as Dave is. He brings a ton to the table when it comes to that stuff. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to do as best I can to give you the general vibe of the show, the AEW show, and, uh, and definitely give you my thoughts on each and everything that happened. Uh, on Dynamite this week. Dynamite, by the way, this week uh, emanated from the Kia Forum in Los Angeles, California, which was an interesting choice considering how god-awful it looked on TV. They did uh, almost 5,000, like 4,700 in attendance, which is absolutely a fine number um, for a house that usually is... uh, Looks pretty good, five five thousand on AEW TV. But I'm 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 thinking because the Kia Forum is so cavernous, and Tony Khan loves booking his giant cavernous stadiums. They had basically the entire place uh, blacked out, so the sound was actually very good. It sounded like a relatively hot crowd, uh, and it didn't match up with what you're looking at though on screen because it's it, the. It, it wasn't just hard cam this week. It was blacked out basically past the first five rows of, of fans. It looked like what you'd normally see from like an indie show where there's 500 people there. I'm guessing it's because it's, it was spread so sparsely out uh, amongst the, you know, a 15,000 seat ish arena. But, it, but it, like I said, the fans, they, they did their job. They made it sound good. Uh, and it was a good house. It just, the optics, not not so hot. Uh, again, don't book these cavernous houses, Tony, please. The show this week started off with uh, Mercedes Monet uh, coming out and cutting a promo, which is always a question. <laughs> um, but coming off of proving uh, everybody wrong, essentially, that was doubting her uh, at the pay-per-view, uh, probably better vibes here than what we're used to with the Mercedes Monet uh, promos. It was a little funky because I still am, it's not completely clear what direction she's going in, specifically after the Willow feud uh, is now evidently over, whether Mercedes is is going to be fully heel or uh, turn kind of babyface or conditional heel, conditional babyface. Was she just conditional heel for the Willow feud because Willow is such a a babyface and, uh, and now she's going back and forth, but it in the, over the course of this promo, it felt to me like Mercedes actually went kind of back and forth between heel and face. Um, I'm not going to do the word for word promos for a lot of these uh, on this particular show, but this one I, I, I will because I want I want you guys to get an idea of what I'm talking about here. Uh, Mercedes comes out. Uh, she's got there's balloons uh, like celebration stuff. In the ring, um, much akin to like when MJF won the world title the first time. And again, a heel move. Uh, It's a big celebration to kick the show off that's apparently being thrown by the person that's being celebrated. So like very heelish. Uh, Mercedes gets on the mic and says, Los Angeles, say hello to your new CEO and TBS champion. Wasn't I worth the wait? Didn't I tell you money changes everything? And I did exactly that at Double or Nothing. Not only did we celebrate five years of AEW, we celebrated the in-ring return of the greatest of all time, me. And she got huge CEO chants here, despite, again, to me, this ringing very heelish. Uh, 
and not not even like cool heel. Like she felt like she was leaning into the heel thing, but big time CEO chance happening right here. Uh, she goes on to say, you guys, I am proud to say that this past Sunday, Willow and I tore the house down to, that was a big pop right there from the crowd. Uh, Willow had the run of her career and she gave me the fight of my life, but damn girl, you're just way too nice. I could have told you a mile away that Chris and that sneaky snake Stokely were going to screw you over. But Willow, when you come back, I hope you're better than ever. And I hope you kick their ass. Now back to my celebration, CEO chance. Now that part felt like she just went full baby face. Second half of the promo, uh, like just went like almost like uh, you know multiple personality situation where just that's all baby face stuff. Uh, hoping Willow comes back and kicks uh, Statlander and, and Stokely's ass. Uh, that that's a hundred percent a baby face thing to say, but calling herself the greatest of all time in that way and uh, celebrating in the way that, that Mercedes is right here is ringing very heel too. Uh, so and it's a little confusing. And then um, what happens next also informs that, that Mercedes is probably going to work situational babyface for what's coming up because uh, at this point she is interrupted by Sky Blue up on the Tron uh, who says, Mercedes, Mercedes, up here. You got a little something coming for your celebration. And then she showed the footage of Mercedes being attacked way back when, um, when the lights went out, when she was doing her backstage promo. And uh, so Sky Blue evidently now is taking credit for that. Um, back to Sky. Uh, now that, that was some of my best work, but I'm just getting started. Uh, at this point, Sky Blue then... Evidently, the the Tron stuff was was pre taped because Sky Blue sneaks up from behind and grabs a hold of Mercedes and hits her with like a uh, Samoan drop F five type amalgamation thingy. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but it looked pretty brutal. Um, and uh, that's how we kicked off the show. We are we later find out that we're gonna we're getting a a match for the TBS title between Mercedes and Sky Blue. Uh, you guys know how I feel about impromptu matches, but uh, if if it's going to be an impromptu match, uh, I will happily take one that involves Mercedes Monet uh, back in the ring again this quickly. But it gives me at least a uh, indication that there that she's going to be a, a workman like champ, which you know we want Mercedes in the ring. <laughs> the more in the ring, the less on the mic the brighter her star shines, uh, in my opinion. Uh, we are now uh, let known that uh, the EVPs are going to, at some point during the show, address the future of the TNT title. Uh, if you guys hadn't heard the news or watched Double or Nothing, Edge, uh, Adam Copeland, broke his ankle Um they say leg on this on this show, but then I, I heard reported his ankle later on. But he broke a bone uh, in his lower leg, uh, doing a crazy spot in the the barbed wire steel cage match against Malachi on Sunday. So uh, something's going to have to be done with the TNT title. Uh, at this point, the EVPs Okada and the scapegoat Jack Perry pull up in their. Uh, SUVs and the scapegoat bus, which we we uh, met at, <laughs> at Double or Nothing. Uh, scapegoat drives the scapegoat bus, uh, evidently permanently now. <laughs> the the other guy's just coming out of a regular, like, uh, fancy black SUV. Uh, they did a video recap of Double or Nothing. It was pretty solid. Um, and at this point, uh, we hear, Whose house? And uh, we're in for a Swerve Strickland match. This dude is like the Orange Cassidy of World Heavyweight title uh, champs. He's like, I think he's been on every show. He's like worked a match on every show since he won the title, which that's great. Uh, I love seeing Swerve, but uh, I, I think I'd scale back a little bit, make him feel a little, not to parrot my my broadcast partner my usual broadcast partner but i have been influenced by him a bit and i do think that you got to keep these guys a little bit special uh as much as i love seeing swerve and as much as i've 
absolutely adore his his recent work being like the going back to like the crazy monstrous badass kind of uh, swerve that we all fell in love with he doesn't have to wrestle a match on every every dynamite uh and every other collision <laughs> um we all know that he rules in the ring just uh, we can we can keep him special i did enjoy uh coming out here it, <laughs> prince nana comes out first uh as per usual uh when nana is there with swerve but he's carrying a coffee cup like a empty co- empty has just like take away coffee cup for some reason um which he then pitches to start his uh his little prince nana dance that he does <laughs> the uh, whose house swerve's house dance um it was just amusing i don't know what what the point of it was but it made me giggle uh we find out as swerve is coming down that this is going to in fact be a sponsored house of the dragon whose house match uh as the house of the dragon i believe is a yeah i not just believe house of the dragon is a warner media time uh uh, Endeavor being on, I think it's it airs on Max. Yeah, on Max. So this is a tie-in to another Warner um, product. House of the Dragon, Who's House match, kind of fits because it's, it's Swerve Strickland versus Killswitch, who uh, now that there's no Soros in his name anymore, I suppose we could read uh, his gear as dragon-esque. Um, but also this is going to uh, serve to tie up that last little uh, piece of unfinished business that Swerve has with the patriarchy um, from the start of that, that feud. Uh, this match was, was good. It was, I mean, it was very one-sided, but it was fun. Uh, and it continued to serve what we've been seeing from Swerve, you know, in the very recent past. Uh, it started off with Swerve working the leg, chopping down the big man as you would, but it, it pretty quickly evolved into um, Swerve kind of beating the hell out of uh, Killswitch for the majority of this match. He hits a nasty uh, neck breaker on the floor, hits that headbutt du jour that I have been talking about for the last several weeks that everybody seems to love now, the headbutt from underneath with the accompanied by the super kick kind of slappy thing. <laughs> um, it looks awesome, sounds awesome. I, I understand why everybody's doing it because it is dope as fuck. Um Swerve hit some absolutely super snug uh, European uppercuts in the corner on the big man. Uh, he's like dominating the shit out of this match for the first, uh, I would say, two thirds or so. Uh, we get the the like the gritty uh, taunt without uh, kill switch having registered any offense. I think <laughs> at this point, usually the gritty comes a little bit later, but it's been a beating so far. Um, at the, Kill Switch does power out of a uh, big pressure attempt, but Swerve actually keeps the advantage until Kill Switch then hits the headbutt du jour as well, <laughs> uh, followed by a choke slam. Um, at this point, Kill Switch goes for a chair uh, as Swerve's head is kind of hanging out of the ring. Nana makes the save, grabs the chair away from Kill Switch as he goes to swing the, the chair. Um, and then Killswitch eats a series of boots from Swerve, who is now stood up on the, the apron, to his maw. Uh, a Swerve stomp then to the floor from the ap- ring apron. Uh, Killswitch eventually counters a house call with a choke slam and standing moonsault, um, which is like the most offense that he gets in this match. Swerve hits a German, a house call, a Swerve stomp, and then surprisingly we did get a 2.99 uh, kick out from from Killswitch. Um, I'm thinking to keep him looking relatively strong after t- basically eating a, a, a beat down for this whole match. So it, I understand why they do it. Um, Swerve, I, I loved his reaction here. Um, you never see this uh, when a, a finisher is hit, even though, uh, as we've talked about, the Swerve Snap is not necessarily Swerve's finisher at this point. At least he has not been finishing recent matches with the Swerve Stomp. He did do the house call and Swerve Stomp, so I would consider that kind of a finisher. So you don't usually see the uh, guy hit a finisher, a kick out, and then them just <laughs> say, oh, like, fuck that. I'm going to hit my finisher again and just hit it again and immediately get the pin. Uh, it makes the 
the guy doing it looked pretty smart, and Swerve does that right here. He barely registers the uh, like disbelief face, the NXT, um, oh my God, I can't believe you kicked out face. He, he just kind of looks like, well, no, fuck this, and then immediately hits another house call and uh, quickly makes the pin for the victory. At this point, Nana dances a pair of scissors up into the ring and uh, hands him to Swerve, and he reclaims his dreadlock uh, from Killswitch's head, cuts a cuts a big braid off of Killswitch's head uh, as a receipt for what Killswitch did to him when he ripped the the dread off of Swerve's head to start this uh, that feud. So Swerve ultimately gets the the last laugh as he should, um, and this ties up that that last little uh, bit of um, disrespect that he got from Killswitch at the start of the feud. I, I thought this match, again, it was like, it was, it made Swerve look like a bad motherfucker. <laughs> like, he, uh, he got all the events. It, everything was tight and crisp and looked good. Um, I was a little surprised at how much of a, a whooping it was. I guess, I mean, Killswitch is just kind of a dumb goon guy. Um, so, it, I don't think it would really do him a world of good to have gotten much more offense in on Swerve here anyway. So, uh, yeah, I, I guess I do understand why it was such a one-sided match. And, again, it continues the story of, of Swerve Strickland just looking like, you know, 1998 Stone Cold Steve Austin. And as far as, like, I'm I'm smart, I'm a badass, you can't put one over on me, uh, and if you try, I will kill you and your entire family kind of thing. Uh it is a lot better than when he was kind of first made his baby face turn. It was kind of stumbling through a little bit of uh, uh, like, Oh guys, I, I love you. And I know you respect me kind of nonsense. I'm glad that I'm very glad that Swerve uh, has gone back to or, or re understood what got him over in the first place. And, uh, and he's, he's playing that character again, which could not make me happier. Because the at the only the only point in Swerve Strickland's last I don't know two years that he's felt slightly dry or uh, boring was that little bit of time when he was trying to be a, a white meat baby face. He can be a baby face, but he's not going to be a white meat baby face, and not effectively at least. He's a badass. He should remain a badass, uh, and he did right here. Okay, next up, we got John Moxley. Cutting a promo in the back, um, trying to convince me that Rocky Romero is some kind of a danger to him tonight uh, in their match, in their uh, championship eliminator match, which um, Mox is a great promo, but uh, it's Rocky Romero. I don't think he has a singles win on the AEW roster or while on AEW television. I know he's won matches in multi-mans, but I'm pretty sure he's like winless. And this is John fucking Moxley. Um, it's a solid promo as as usual, but uh, one, I am still pissed about Sunday's result. And two, I think he's playing up the arm thing as much as he is because I think he's been told that he's going to probably lose to evil. Um, and he doesn't want to lose too much heat from that because it's evil. So uh, uh, he's basically uh, acting like he's been crippled. Um, but again, it's a Mox promo. Like, if I'm just judging it by the nuts and bolts, it's good. He did a good job. Um, I'll get more into it uh, when we talk about the match, but uh, something's got to change with, with Mox. Um, it was never more evident than uh, while watching the show, at least to me. Um, next thing we got was a brand new, um, I'm guessing regular, go, soon to be regular, segment on AEW television. Uh, TV time with the learning tree, Chris Jericho. It is a interview segment, um, very much like many of the interview segments that we've seen in the past, specifically from Chris Jericho. Um, he's done a bunch of the, the, I forget what it was called. The, the one where he, uh, with, uh, HBK feud back in WWE where he, uh, I think he got his own head put through the 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 monitor. Um, this would be a, a 
a really nice time for Dave to pipe up if he were here because he definitely knows exactly how that went down. But but that was one of the more famous uh, Chris Jericho um, interview segment type dealies. And this is following in, in uh, those footsteps. This particular set for this for the TV time with the learning tree, Chris Jericho looks to me like uh, very blues clues, like like a a kids show. I think intentionally. It's got a big big tree, uh, like cartoon tree. Uh, there's uh, astroturf across the uh, the mat of the ring, um, and there's like a uh, podium there as well. But it look it's it's very cartoonish looking. At this point, Taz makes a comment saying, oh, there's grass in the middle of the ring here. I mean, it's California. I, I get it. Grass is legal, but come on. Which made me think, Taz, you are an old as fuck. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard anybody except my own parents uh, call marijuana grass. Like maybe outside of a Cheech and Chong movie or something. Uh, Jericho takes the opportunity to thank Everybody for making the Learning Tree University the top selling new t shirt on Shop AEW. I don't believe that can possibly be true. And I, I didn't check it, but uh it's a cool t shirt. <laughs> it's funny, but I just I can't I cannot believe that that many people are on board. Um as much as I am on board with this, I, I'm I, you still hear a lot in the discourse of people that are never gonna be back in on Jericho. Uh Enough so that it would be surprising to me if that wasn't bullshit. If it wasn't bullshitting that his new uh, T-shirt is already number one on Shop AEW. Um, but again, cool looking shirt. And it's Jericho, so he's getting his plug plug in. Uh, he wants to thank all his branches uh, that helped make him and the Redwood number one. I, so I assume his fan base now, the Jericho-holics uh, formerly, are... are now going to be referred to as branches going forward. I love that he calls Big Bill Redwood exclusively. I don't think he's said the man's actual name one time since this faction started. Um, and number one, I'm not sure at what, but uh, it's great. It's Jericho with his cheesy-ass grin on his face doing his thing. It's wonderful. He says, if adversity is ice cream, always put a cherry on top, guys. Again, I don't know what the fuck that's supposed to mean, but it does sound like some bullshit that, uh, like a... Uh, self-help in, uh, speaker, like a <laughs> guy would say, a, um, and it works perfectly for, <laughs> despite not making any goddamn sense, it works perfectly for this Jericho character. Uh, he then brings out bounty hunter Brian Keith, who, if you guys didn't see the pay-per-view, um, double or nothing, Brian Keith aided Jericho in his uh, FTW title match. Uh, and we were left to assume that Brian Keith would be joining or the, the next to sit under the, the learning tree. Uh, and this is just kind of um, making that assumption a uh, reality. Uh, Jericho says uh, to, to Brian Keith, I really, I respect that you are a bad man, Brian Keith. And then Big Bill chimes in with, uh, oh, I'd, e- I'd even say he's a <laughs> bad apple. Uh, at which point Jericho says, Judge out, and the bad apple doesn't fall too far from the learning tree. Ha 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 ha. That, that uh, ridiculous laughter I'm doing is uh, is verbatim. I'm not doing it. Uh, I wouldn't make that noise at you guys if it wasn't what Jericho was actually doing. Uh, uh, I actually thought he, I think he oversells that laugh a little bit. Um, although it, is one of the few things that differentiates this this gimmick that he's got going from what the Bucks are doing. It's I, I know they're not the same, but they are similar. I've I've expressed my concerns uh, before that he, that Jericho might just be aping uh, the most over guys again um, with this and kind of uh, pulling the wool over our eyes by like making us believe that, oh, because he's in on the joke, uh, it's fine, but, like, it also, yes, he's in on the joke, but he's he's also, like, currently kind of ripping it off. Um, but it, whatever. It's it's very amusing to me. I've enjoyed all of these bits, particularly since uh, Jericho is, like, 
debuted the the name Learning Tree, and uh, since he has really leaned into it, um, I big Bill man, I love him. I love him so much. He his facials here, he his delivery of the cheesy jokes. Uh, I think is actually better than Jericho's. Ah, uh, I hope like I really I really do hope that. This, however, this thing goes, it serves to uh, elevate Big Bill from the mid to the upper card because he didn't need uh, any seasoning or I mean I know that's part of the joke, but like I want big things for Big Bill. I think that dude could be a like a world title contender, like a top of the card guy. He's got the look. He can talk like a motherfucker. He's he can go. Everything he does looks awesome. Um, Brian Keith is a guy that like I I do think fits more uh you know he we don't know a ton about him the, uh, you know unless you were big on the indie scene um we didn't know much about brian keith until fairly recently and so he hasn't had very much exposure big bill has like he uh we know what big bill is brian keith uh on the other hand while very talented and uh accomplished pro wrestler in his own right um like he could use the tv time uh no uh pun intended there so like he, he fits this stable a little bit better than than big bill like would from a logic standpoint but i love what big bill's doing since he's been in the stable so i guess i guess it is working with him too uh at this point the the hook bat signal goes up um and as hook starts down the ramp Jericho starts waving hello <laughs> to Hook, which popped me pretty hard. I thought that was very amusing. Uh, it was like a kid's show, a friendly wave. Hello, good to see you, Hook, kind of thing. Uh, very amusing. Uh, before Hook can make his way all the way to the ring, because I, uh, I was a little concerned being that the the numbers game was three on one, uh, and one of the guys is a seven-foot-tall monster that... Uh, Hook was just going to get his ass handed to him as soon as he got to the ring. Um, but before he can, before he can get all the way down the ramp, uh, Samoa jo- Joseph, uh, Samoa Joe's music hits, and Joe like uh, materializes somehow in front of uh, Hook. Uh, the camera didn't really show how it happened, and the announce crew didn't didn't fill us in. Um, but it was kind of funny, and <laughs> Joe Joe and his Hawaiian shirt just materialized in front of Hook, uh, stopping him. And then uh, Joe whispers something into Hook's ear, and Hook kind of gives him a knowing nod, and then they 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 leave together without confronting the learning tree. Um, and we will hear a little bit more from them later on in the show. We get, uh, at this point, a little uh, video package intro to Stephanie Vakur, who is a uh, CMLL talent, but also uh, works with New Japan. Uh, she's scary as hell. She's an awesome wrestler. The uh, video package does a really nice job letting us know all of this. Um, and the reason we're seeing this is because we are officially in uh, Forbidden Door uh, season. And as I previously predicted, uh, it's because NJPW is... is uh, so sparse at this point at the top of the card, particularly because AEW has sapped them so much of their talent. The CMLL, CMLL is going to have, I think, a bigger footprint on the Forbidden Door than uh, in past years when it was basically just NJPW versus AEW. I think this is going to be more of a international versus AEW, which is a good, good plan. Uh, NJPW just does not have a whole ton going on right now. And the stuff that we would be kind of interested in seeing is stuff that we've kind of already seen. You can only, you know, roll uh, uh, Ishii out there so many times um, before it stops being like a special thing. And Forbidden Door is supposed to be a special thing. Excuse me, a special thing. Um, So I think that incorporating the CMLL guys, uh, Hachisero Head, as you guys know I am, uh, is going to make it feel more special than having just two promotions involved. After the Stephanie Vakur video package, we got the, the aforementioned uh, John Moxley versus Rocky Romero. 
championship eliminator match. I uh, I also don't like that they're doing championship eliminator matches for NJPW titles on AEW TV. I know it kind of feeds into the uh, the the whole Forbidden Door thing, but I I'm sticking to my guns here. When when Mox first showed up with the 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 Divas title, then. Uh, is the current NJPW or IWGP World Heavyweight title on AEW TV. I said I didn't want to see that defended on AEW TV. It's fine for him to carry it, to be acknowledged as such, but doing these eliminator matches, one at the pay-per-view, that, oof, go listen to that well, when it drops on, on Monday uh, to get my thoughts on that one. Um, and then uh, now another eliminator uh, versus Rocky Romero. Oh, actually, though, now that I think about it, it makes more sense that Rocky Romero would be in an eliminator match for an NJPW title because he does get wins in NJPW. Um, he just doesn't uh, in AEW, which is, uh, is another reason why you shouldn't do this match on AEW TV. It'd be fine to do on NJPW TV. <laughs> um, uh, what this match proved to me more than anything else, beyond a shadow of a doubt, is that this Moxley character just needs a like a character shakeup, a change of some kind. He's been doing the same thing for too long. Uh, I don't know what the change should be. I, I think I'm, I'm confident in the man's talent and ability to do. He he made uh, you know uh, lemonade out of lemons a bunch of times and and back in the Fed, but he's so good. I think he could do a whole lot of different things that are still would would wouldn't completely alter this character, um, but would make him not exactly the same as he's been. Which is, and the reason I know that I'm just, uh, this shtick is beyond uh, recovery for me is that I should have enjoyed the shit out of this match. It was re- a really well-worked match. It was intelligently worked. It was Moxley, uh, he did like kind of a, like a, like a combo of, uh, his normal like hard hitting stuff, but mixed it in with uh, like a ca- more of a catch as catch can uh, Danielson esque kind of thing. Uh, clearly to make up for the injury that he's selling this like this terrible torn up arm shoulder deal. His arm also is uh, wrapped like a mummy again for this match. Um, I liked it's intelligently worked. I liked the story that was being told in the match. Um, I like the way that Rocky Romero works the match. He like the he starts off like absolutely flying, uh, attacking Moxley with a uh, missile drop kick from the you know from inside the ring to the to the outside, and just is immediately going like targeting that arm um, and is very relentless uh, attacking it. And everything looks good from both guys. Everything looks crisp and tight and real. And uh, still, I was bored to tears here. Something's got to change with Mox because we, this is becoming very Mox wins LOL to me. And uh, I don't want that to happen because I like John Moxley so much. Uh, the guy, and I'm a fan of the wrestler as well, but you can't do the same thing for five straight years and it not get stale. MJF knows that, as we recently found out. Um, I mean, we knew that already, but the best all know that. They recognize that. You don't have to necessarily do the Jericho, you know, completely reinvent yourself, but you do need a character shake up here and there. You can't do the same thing no matter how great it is. You can't do the same thing for five straight years of pro wrestling and have people not get bored with it. Uh, Mox wins with a Death Rider here. Uh, big surprise. The next thing we got was a backstage segment with Samoa Joe and Hook. Um, uh, Renee Paquette asks what that was about, essentially. (laughs) And uh, Samoa Joe says, we learned our first lesson. Uh, We do not exist on their time. No truly dangerous men exist. Excuse me. No truly dangerous men exist on our time. So it looks very much like we are getting like a dueling mentors sitch with uh, with Joe and and Jericho. I am here for it. I like Joe uh, switching it up. Like I just said about Mox, Joe's character is great, but we've seen it for a while. So him doing kind of a like baby face mentor type thing here. I'm excited for what is to come. 
mostly because it means that we're going to get to hear Joe talk, which is just entertaining to me, no matter what the situation is. But I do like a little bit of a change in the character. I would prefer if Joe could stop wearing the Hawaiian shirts, though, is his current gimmick, because it just makes me think that he is a big, fat party animal um, every single time I see him, which takes a little bit away from the mystique of Joe. And the thing that he's trying to teach the hook at this point is that uh, badassery and the badassery part of that uh, gets muted a little bit when it's coming at you in a Hawaiian shirt as uh, Rene Paquette or uh, Katsuhiro Shibata would uh, would tell you it's it's a very busy shirt for a man of his size um, <laughs> doesn't really work great at least for me but everything else about it I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of and I'm here for uh, at this point in the show, we get Don Callis uh, coming out to a cascade of booze. Uh, out to Callis is coming out to uh, make good on his promise to offer a contract. Uh, conspicuously, did not say to whom when he announced that he would be making a contract offer uh, at forbid. Or, excuse me, at double or nothing. Uh, but he is out to make a, a contract. Callis gets on the mic, and uh, it's a wonderful nonstop heat um, booze. The crowd, again, the crowd sounded real good here. It's like such a weird juxtaposition of, of cavernous looking, um, and lit like there's nobody there, but I can hear that there are a good number of fans there. It's a good house. Uh, they just got to they gotta, they gotta sort out what kind of buildings they they should be booking for these these weekly TV things? Uh, I'm I'm desperately hoping that the the word on the street is incorrect and that Tony Khan is not considering extending Dynamite to three hours because that's another thing that I I would have big time questions about mostly because I've never seen a three hour weekly pro wrestling show that is good um, like consistently. Raw, even with all the the improvements that they've made from Monday Night Raw, it, they the the biggest problem on that show still is the pacing is brutal, and they have to do a, a bunch of weird commercial break decisions and to stretch stuff out. And, and like, I love the pacing and dynamite. I know some people think that it's too frenetic, that it's like you know uh, coked up Tony Khan booking too much stuff into uh, one show, but I, that's what I love about it is I don't ever get bored watching dynamite because it's thing to thing to thing to thing. Um, it's not always uh, really super well thought out. It has been for the most part in 2024. Um, and when it is well thought out, everything flows one thing to the next perfectly. But even when it's not well thought out and it's all haphazard and wonky, it's still not boring. I'm afraid if they go to three hours, it's going to be difficult to do that. Who knows? Maybe he, maybe Tony Khan is capable of booking a three-hour show and keeping up that that dynamite pace. But I, uh, I have my doubts that anybody can, and I, so, so that's why I, I'm kind of hoping that we just keep dynamite to two hours with the occasional maybe tacked on uh, rampage. Maybe make rampage a floating show. You can tack that on occasionally to dynamite or collision when you have a particularly stacked card or whatever go to three hours you know once a month or something um that wouldn't be terrible i don't think uh anyway back to callus in the ring uh says that what he's holding in his hand look at the contract is more valuable than gold it is more valuable than diamonds uh it's been a pleasure for him to scout uh someone as talented as orange cassidy uh he sees a lot of himself in orange cassidy which is very funny um and uh, at this point, Excalibur says that the last person to get booed this hard in L.A. was Larry Bird, which I enjoyed. Um, Orange Cassidy then comes out uh, to Jane, the, his theme music. He's back to using Jane here, which I was not happy about after um, going back to uh, the Pixies at the pay-per-view, which I think in my opinion, the Pixies fits the current Orange Cassidy character much better than Jane does. I think Jane did fit what OC had been doing um, when it was all fun and games kind of stuff, but like now it's getting a little darker. I think that uh, 
where is my mind? Just fits much better. So I was not super happy to see him coming out to Jane here. Um, I did notice at this point, though, that Don Callis is wearing the most fantastic bedazzled loafers I've ever seen in my life, though. So that made me feel not so bad about the Jane thing. Uh, Don Callis' attire, as always, absolutely on point. I need to get myself a pair of those loafers and his literal rose-colored glasses. Uh, Callis does, at this point, offer the contract to uh, Orange Cassidy after making a joke about, oh, oh should, I, should I give it to you like this? And then pantomiming like he was taking it out of his pocket uh, in the OC style. Uh, Orange Cassidy takes the, the contract from Callis' hand, which elicits an immediate, yeah, from, uh, from Don Callis. But then uh, Orange Cassidy immediately tears the uh, contract up in a very, very slow Orange Cassidy style. Um, Callis is apoplectic at this point. No one says no to me, uh, screaming and yelling in Orange Cassidy's face. And then, surprisingly, uh, Stokely Hathaway and Chris Statlander come out onto the ramp. Um, and Stokes says, uh, there's nothing about Orange Cassidy that I like. Uh, and, and the reason that is, is because he's too much like Orange Cassidy is too much like Willow Nightingale. So yada, yada, yada. I, I hate you. Um, Statlander takes the microphone and says, on behalf of my best friend, he accepts the invitation to the Don Callis family, uh, which at, at this point, the camera then cuts back to in the ring. Um, who Statlander is referring to is Trent, who is now is snuck into the ring, um, besuited, wearing a black suit, uh, and gets the drop on, on Orange Cassidy, uh, attacking him. Big, huge heat. Big, a giant fuck you, Trent. Chant goes up. Uh, Orange Cassidy gets busted open in the in the ensuing beatdown. Trent really selling it, putting over the uh, I hate you, screaming his face off. I love Trent here. I like Trent uh, in the Callis family too. Uh, I love Trent. I love heel Trent. I, I think he, he sells it beautifully. I think he just has, he has punchable face kind of, and uh, it just fits. And I, I like him just uh, incalculably more as a bad guy than as a silly good guy. I, I love Trent here. Um, and I'm excited to see what, uh, what comes of this. Oh yeah. Tra- to, to finish the segment out, um, Trent and Callis do the, you've got to give the people what they want hug with full camera, uh, pan back shot. And while they're doing it, Callis has got his foot on uh, a prone orange Cassidy's chest in the middle of the ring. The only thing I really didn't like about this, uh, this segment was, uh, to me, it felt like it made, uh, OC Orange Cassidy look kind of dumb. Like, of course you had, you should have seen the Trent, thing coming like everybody saw it coming and Orange Cassidy's characters is always been kind of the or at least for the second half of his run in AEW has been like this one of the smartest guys in the room he's a really smart baby face he should have saw, seen this coming um I guess that is why you may, maybe though you bring out uh Stokely and and Statlander because that would uh draw his attention away from the 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 jumping that he should have seen coming like that, that would be kind of shocking to orange Cassidy that, okay, now Statlander's turning on me too. Um, so yeah, okay. I guess that, that fits, that works. I'm okay with it. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll allow it. And I, I, I am looking forward to what, what we get from Trent going forward here. I, although I assume that, well, man, obviously this feud is continuing, and with Orange Cassidy having gotten that first victory, it was a, it was an interesting booking decision because I don't, I mean, I you can't beat Trent again, I don't think, uh, after having just made the the heel turn, and they very rarely like to beat Orange Cassidy. So, although I, I could see I could see OC wanting to put over his real life friend, uh, so maybe that's where this is going. As uh, Orange Cassidy lose, rare, loses the rare feud here, uh, and to put over Trent and make him more believable as a as a, a threat, bad guy. At this point, we get a Daniel Garcia backstage promo. Say hello to your mother for me. I'm always happy for a Daniel Garcia uh, promo after after Dave's 
brilliant observation that uh, he is Dirk Diggler, basically. <laughs> and and uh, um, he calls out uh, Osprey for the international title. He actually cuts a very solid promo. We, uh, we get a very solid Dirk Diggler serious promo from uh, from our guy here. Danny Magic is, is with him, by the way, in, the, in this backstage segment. It's very short and to the point. He's looking to, to get the international title. He doesn't care who's got it. Um, although he does make a couple of allusions to... Uh, to uh, Will Ospreay in the promo he doesn't call him out directly. Um, he just he's coming for the title, uh, and I'm here for that. So Daniel Garcia, Will Ospreay, hell yes. Uh, honestly, like my left shoe versus Will Ospreay would be, I'd be here for it. It doesn't fucking matter who you put in the ring with that guy. But yeah, Daniel Garcia is awesome. So like. Uh, I already saw Danielson versus Osprey. Well, let's get the younger version. Uh, hell yes. Here for it. Uh, next up was that TBS uh, championship match, the aforementioned Mercedes Money versus uh, Sky Blue. Um, this, for whatever reason, replaced a previously advertised match between Soraya and, uh, um, excuse me. I keep wanting to say Mercedes Monet, uh, Mariah May, Mariah May and um, Soraya got pushed to next week. Initially, I was a little worried that maybe Soraya was re-injured or something because why did they take this off the show? But just pushing it to next week, I don't think it be, could be because of injury. I, I'm, I'm hoping it's not just that they didn't want to put two women's matches on. I like my hope was that Mercedes coming in would allow for them to give us more women's matches on dynamite because it's the show I watch the most and the women's division fucking rules in this company. Um, but, uh, so far we're, we're sticking to the one woman's match per dynamite, uh, post Jade Cargill world that we've been in. Um, I understand why it would, you want to get Mercedes out there again, immediately one to placate people like me who've been saying nonstop since she debuted that it's Mercedes. She's worth the money. In, in the ring, in between the ropes, that's where she makes, like, it's where she does it. That's where she's got her her charisma, her most charisma, uh, and that's where uh, she's got her most talent because she's one of the best uh, just in-ring workers that there is. So, yeah, you want to you get her out there. Now that now that we've broken the seal, we can hopefully get her out there almost weekly. I, I, I wouldn't mind seeing her kind of take that swerve role of fighting champion and just be on TV wrestling every week. Uh, I don't really need the promos <laughs> at all anymore. We opened the show with one error, um, but it led to a match at least this time. And this was good. Again, it was good in ring stuff from Mercedes and sky blue. It was not the level of uh, Willow and Mercedes at the pay-per-view at the, at uh, double or nothing. Uh, again, tune in please on Monday or on Tuesday for uh Dave and I are full take on on that show, but that match absolutely ruled. This is just good work, but still good work from from Mercedes. Um, Sky seemed a little bit hesitant here. I I kind of wonder, if being so young, if she was a little bit starstruck being in the ring with somebody who's like uh, she probably looked up to, um, uh, one of the four horsewomen. Uh, so it took her a little bit of time to get like warmed up, uh, but. Mercedes looked looked very good again. She had an awesome meteora from the apron to the floor. She's the queen of the meteora. Uh, I think she does that move better than anybody outside of maybe Andrade, um, who evidently has been relegated to speed. Uh, <laughs> Andrade, uh, side note. Um, Sky does start to like heat up herself, though, when she hits a, a pretty nice like boot to Mercedes, the side of her head. Um, as Mercedes is like coming back into the ring through the ropes and then follows up like a, a pretty badass looking neck breaker. Uh, she does her like cheeky Nando's kick thing that looked pretty good. Um, a full Nelson slam that was a little wonky seemed like that they, the two of them didn't have uh, great communication there or, or maybe just because they hadn't worked together, obviously yet. Uh, it was the only little hitch in the match that I saw. Um, when blue, when sky blue goes to do her full Nelson slam, um, Mercedes does not initially, uh, go super smoothly into it. It takes two efforts, but it looked great once, once it was done. 
Um, they trade back and forth really nice looking, uh, like high knee uh, from Mercedes into the thrust kick from Sky. Uh, Sky goes for the code blue. Mercedes counters it into, I believe, the best looking moneymaker she's done. I think. I think I've seen all of them because it's only been a handful of NJPW matches and then what she's done in AEW. Uh, I don't. I still don't love the finisher for her because I think for too many of her opponents, it's going to be, it's going to continue to be too many steps to set it up. Uh, and I like finishers that are more snappy and you can kind of hit, uh, like Randall Keith says from out of nowhere. Um, this one though, if all of them looked like this one. I'd be down for her keeping it because it was real snappy. looked great. looked real impactful. Um, much prefer Mercedes doing her talking in the ring rather than on the microphone. Um, at this point, Stephanie Vakur uh, comes out, so she is in attendance, and uh, gives Mercedes the post-match stare down, holding up her uh, NJPW strong title. And intimating that that it's probably going to be Mercedes' forbidden door opponent. Fuck yes. I am very much there for that. Um, my hope after forbidden door is that maybe with Mercedes doing this kind of babyface-ish look on this show uh, and calling out Stokely and, and Statlander, that my, that's my, my dream match can happen uh, following... Um, uh, Forbidden Door, and we'll, uh, we'll get Mercedes versus Stat. I, that's like I think it's the best match they can put on um, in that division right now, for my money. And uh, I'm just dying to see it. I'm dying to see Statlander can't have a bad match. Uh, and Mercedes works so incredibly well with bigger, stronger opponents. It would just rule. Uh, so hopefully that's what the little weird baby face stuff is leaning towards, at least for for me. Uh, we then get, uh, speaking, speak of the devil, uh, we get Statlander and Big Stoke, uh, backstage, in a backstage segment. Stoke says, uh, Statlander came back from two back-to-back torn ACLs, uh, when most of these bitches around here get a sinus infection and want time off. And before anybody gets mad, I ain't even t- started talking about the women's division yet. I'm talking about the men, which, good line. Uh, Statlander says that she, uh, the first time she does one thing for herself and she gets booed for it, um, she had to make a change because essentially because everybody um, was happy to, to take her protection for granted. Now they got to be now they're gonna have to be protected from her. It's her I, for me, it's the best promo she's cut in AEW. Who knew that Chris Antler was a fantastic heel promo um, and it's like eh, at this point, uh, tur- just turn them heel when like the uh, a baby face thing isn't working. Although the Statlander, it was it was working. It was uh, it was just time for something a little bit different. But um, but it it's like a cliche. You know, just turn them turn them heel, uh, assuming that that they're going to be uh, the performer is going to be better as a heel or or whatever. Um, but it's cool when it happens and uh, a person that you you think of one way completely for the entirety of their career shows almost immediately that they're probably better at the other way. And that's what Statlander showed to me, at least here just seems like a badass, like monster. I can't wait for her to get more matches now. Um, at this point we get a absolutely fucking awesome MJF video package that makes him feel like an absolutely enormous star. Uh, I was bummed that we didn't get MJF immediately, but I understand why. Um, after the pay-per-view, they they wanted to advert. I assume they wanted to advertise his first TV uh, appearance, which is going to happen next week. Um, but this this video package goes over the entirety of MJF's accomplishments and just it makes him feel like The Rock or something. It's awesome. Um, I'm not as reliant or uh, care as much about video packages as my normal cohort here, uh, David, does. But when they're done right, they can be really, really great and effective. <laughs> I, I got to admit, and this this was one of them. Um, fantastic video package. At this point, the EVPs uh, come out, um, and I think I am actually convinced that the, the coin thing 
that I joked, oh, yeah, they did that on purpose when it bounced one time on the mat thing before making the, the ting tink noise. Uh, I, they've done it three times in a row that way. So I'm, now I'm, I think it is on purpose, um, which would be amazing. <laughs> I, I still I don't, I don't know if I, can believe, if I can believe that, but it's been three times in a row. So like, eh, maybe it is on purpose. Um, and it looks great when that happens. Uh, after the EVPs come out, Okada and followed by the scapegoat um, to their own theme musics. Uh, all, they all get in the ring. Okada gets the mic first and uh, just <laughs> to the crowd says, shut up, bitches. He super loves, as I've pointed out <laughs> before, super loves saying bitch, calling people bitch. Uh, it's becoming his thing. I'm happy because uh, it makes me makes me laugh when he does. Uh, his... His heel antics are just a delight. Uh, but that's all he says for right now. Uh, shut up, bitches. Scapegoat gets on the mic and tells us that the elite run this shit. Um, he gets to swear now that he's a bad guy. Um, <laughs> says that Tony Khan and Kenny Omega handpicked their dream team. And that dream team pulled out all the stops at Double or Nothing, even setting me on fire. Uh, but not only did we still win... I took my piece of the dragon when I pinned Brian Danielson, which was the finish at Double or Nothing, uh, to that fantastic match. Again, please tune in to our uh, pay-per-view special to hear our full thoughts. Uh, Nicholas Jackson then gets on the mic and says it's been a fantastic week for the Elite. Uh, they released their Reebok Pump, the best-selling Reebok in years. Um, they come bearing gifts. Uh the, a new Lambo for Okada, uh, as as evidenced by the Tron at this point. Okada just goes over the top. Oh my God! Oh my God! Thank you so much! Oh, thank you so much! Uh, Nicholas then gets on the mic and uh, starts a "You deserve it" chant, which the the crowd uh, does pick up on and does immediately. Uh, at which point, Okada uh, feigns crying. And then pulls his hands away from his face to uh, give a like kind of a shit eaten grin. Uh, you idiots, you fell for it, kind of thing. Like, of course, I'm not touched. I'm not touched by anything. I'm a goddamn heel. Uh, he continues to be great. At this point, we get uh, Matthew Jackson on the mic, and as per usual for these for these bits, Matthew's the the one that. Um, really breaks down the nuts and bolts of what, what this segment's going to be. So I'm going to do his uh, a little bit more word for word, and also because it allows me to do uh, my Matthew Jackson impersonation. Um, and whatever, I'm never, never going to say no to that. So here we go. Matthew says, All right, on to business. At double or nothing, during the TNT title match, Adam Copeland was badly injured. That's on me, because right before the match, I was sitting right there, right there at the go, and I wished Adam good luck and said, break a leg. So I think I jinxed you, Adam. So sorry about that. We're praying for you. We're thinking about you. But as EVPs, we've got to make the tough decisions. Adam Copeland, tonight you are hereby stripped of the TNT Championship. The network execs have really been on our case, saying we really need a new champion, which is amusing because that just just happened. Uh, well, we know just the guy. After the biggest pinfall victory of his entire career, I present to you the new TNT champion, the scapegoat Jack Perry, to absolutely huge heat, uh, like Don Callis level heat. Um, Perry's celebrating on the uh, turnbuckle and people are bowing their goddamn faces off. At this point, Christopher Daniels comes out and informs the uh, elite that he has a new job. Uh, Tony Khan has just made him uh, interim EVP. So whatever he says is coming directly from the boss, which I'm glad. Give Tony Khan a mouthpiece on on the show because that means Tony Khan's not on the show. Cool. Um, And this works in story. Uh, and because, and wait, Christopher Daniel says, you know, uh, speaking for Tony, because this is AEW where the best wrestle, 
the way that we're going to determine who the new champ actually is is a series of qualifier matches, uh, no interference, uh, uh, basically like pure rules, um, qualifier matches, culminating in a ladder match at Forbidden Door for the title. Um, Matthew is not happy about this <laughs> and says to his cohorts, uh, oh, we're, we're actually, we're really, we're glad to, that you're back in the company. We're back with us, Christopher. Uh, let's let's go show Christopher a while, how happy we are that he's back. And uh, like they start getting out of the ring with, you're going to beat the shit out of Christopher Daniels. At which point, uh, at which point the acclaimed music hits and the acclaimed and uh, along with Max Caster's wonderful mustache, uh, come out and um, and thwart the impending beatdown before it could start. Uh, I don't know if this is going to lead to anything as far as acclaimed story goes besides them just being a handy baby face, but I, I'm okay with, with uh, a little acclaimed elite action um, in, the, in the short interim at least. I, I prefer it without Billy Gunn involved, but uh, eh, whatever. Max Caster's mustache makes up for Billy Gunn at this point. Uh, Swerve and Nana are now shown uh, backstage, and Nana says, Boss, they might as well call you Stevie Wonder because there's nobody that can see you in that ring. Um, uh, shout out to John Cena, Word Life, Basic Thugonomics. Um <laughs> Swerve says that he's interested in who his next opponent is going to be, so he'll be watching the Casino Gauntlet match, which is uh, t- t- still to come, which is going to determine who the uh, number one contender and uh, who Swerve's opponent is going to be at Forbidden Door. Um, it is advertised now that MJF will be back next week on Dynamite, uh, and then they cut to Roosh, who is evidently going to be his first opponent, which is fuck yes, uh, Roosh says, remember, you mess with the bulge, you get the horns. Uh, not a, not an easy return for MJF, but goddamn, if MJF's going to be uh, what seems like a little hard-edged baby face for now, I think, I, I suspect heel soon, but um, but hard-edged baby face better than goofy baby face. If he's going to continue the hard-edged baby face thing for now, Roosh is not a bad way to start that. Um, I think that could kick total ass. I don't think it was advertised as a match necessarily for next week. It was advertised as MJF returns. I don't know if these are going to confront Rouge is going to confront MJF, but it was definitely insinuated that they're going to face off in some way. I hope it's a match because that would roll. Um, at this point, we get the main... Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> we get our main event of the evening. Uh, the Casino Gauntlet match which has quickly become uh, my favorite gimmick match in all of professional wrestling. Um, this one, again, was absolutely amazing. I'm not even going to try to go spot for spot here because I'd be here all day not doing that. Uh, I will give these bullets, though, about this match. Uh, Jay White and Claudio both need to be in every fucking one of these because Claudio is such an incredible base for all of the uh, Lucha and Lucha adjacent guys that uh, populate these matches otherwise. And Jay White is just like superb when it comes to like being a sneaky prick and his style, his style of wrestling just fits the heel role of this type of match. So perfectly he sneaks up on everybody believably and uh, gets a zillion near falls believably. And he's done it in both, both these matches um, but both times they've done these matches and, and, uh, he came out first here for this one. And I think that was not, uh, coincidence. I think it's, it's because he's, he is just like, uh, he's like a magic pill to make these matches feel like they're nonstop high stakes. He's just great. They also fixed the one, uh, like bit of an issue that, that I had with the, the prior, casino gauntlet match and that they actually have a countdown now i like they they maintain the it's not at it's at um varying intervals that that people come out it's they're not going to do like every two minutes or whatever it's still at varying intervals which is a good good idea 
stick to that, continue to do that. But now we get a little five second countdown, which is nice because it gives the fans a little countdown and fans love countdowns uh, before they get to, you know, hear the music, a little five seconds of anticipation. Uh, and it is five seconds. It's not a 10 second countdown. I, I like that too. I think that fits this match better than a 10 second would. Whereas like a 10 second, it works better for something like the Royal Rumble. Um, but this with the nonstop action, uh, what they're promoting here, five seconds is perfect. Uh, Leo Rush fucking rules. I miss him so much. Uh, he's back for this match because he is a uh, NJPW star now, and um, it was great to see him. Uh, we got we got my boy. I am a full on Hechicero head, as uh, and proudly so. Uh, got to see Hechicero in action here. Uh, Show to Umino also. So this. This gauntlet match clearly not just to determine a, a number one contender, but also to give us kind of a like a, a tasting, <laughs> like a tasting menu of potential guys that we could see at Forbidden Door. Uh, who knows with what you know mix and match the opponents, but like Leo Rush, Hechicero, Shota Umino, those are all guys I could see getting singles matches uh, with good reason for Forbidden Door. Um, Orange Cassidy is in this match and he is now coming out again to Where Is My Mind so yay looks like that he's going to use that I, I think um, awesome he's selling that injury the whole time that he uh, received uh, from the beatdown he got from uh, from Trent earlier in the show um, but I'm uh, just made me happy that he came out to Where Is My Mind here I uh, just please stick to that I, li- I like it much more more than than Jane with the current character. Uh, I was shocked at the finish of the match because Will Ospreay uh, is two for two now in Casino Gauntlet matches. Uh, shocked and delighted. I fucking love this booking. I, I think that potentially this could be the smartest possible move for Will Ospreay and for Swerve Strickland at this point. As long as... Swerve goes over at Forbidden Door. I I don't I think it's way too early again. I mean, I know he's the most over guy and he's my favorite. Uh well, there's there's some competition now with um Salt of the Earth back in town, but basically my favorite and uh and the most over babyface on the company. I don't think that automatically means you need to put the world title on him now. Uh or like or, or even at all uh it all out like everybody's calling for or seems to be calling for or I'm sorry all in um just because it's in England or whatever I I I don't want to put the belt on him that fast I if he was a heel sure but yeah for a baby face I think it's better to to let him chase for as long as you can um and what you could do here is have swerve win an incredible I'm sure it'll be an incredible match it's fucking swerve and and the billy goat for Christ's sake um you have Swerve win at at Forbidden Door, and that puts Swerve over huge uh, as like a non transitional champ, makes him look like a monster. He, he's the first guy that can beat uh, Will Osprey, and that also takes care of the pesky undefeated streak. Uh, I hate undefeated streaks in wrestling because they get in the way more than anything else, um, and. Uh, I think if you got to beat Osprey, the way to do it is to do it with the world champ. It doesn't take anything away from from Osprey to lose a match to Swerve Strickland uh, at this point. I think it elevates elevates Swerve, uh, and Osprey doesn't lose any any heat from that. I don't think personally. I think it's uh, good all around, and then we can move Will Osprey on to another feud with one of these zillion incredible, uh, like dream opponents that that uh he could match up with feud with any of them i actually that this this match itself the casino gauntlet match was yet another like beautiful illustration of all the potential dream match slash feuds that will osprey could potentially have down the line here um because the two seconds each that we get to see him in the ring with with all these different these different stars uh really wet my appetite for for some Billy Goat action. Does that sound gross? <laughs> wet, wet my appetite for some Billy Goat action? Uh, 
I would say overall this was a uh, a decent dynamite with a fucking fantastic main event. Uh, the, the whole thing was hurt a little bit by the way that the crowd looked despite their bef- best efforts. Um, but the main event was just absolutely wonderful. Um, and in, in, in both action and in booking. Um, and it makes me very excited for what is to come. Uh, that that's it for this week's AEW, um, blue thunder pod. Uh, please go check out the WWE edition of the blue thunder pod. We'll be dropping at the same time as this. That also will be a, a singles action, a back to tag team, uh, action, Dave and myself next week. And, and even before that, uh, for the, the pay-per-view specials. Um, so thanks for joining me guys. And I hope you tune in again next week. Bye-bye, guys. Uh, I guess I'll have to do the day. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Dave does it better. Sorry, guys. Bye.